Fuzzy TV. Good morning, everybody. This is Martin Zender from a Red Roof Inn in Canton, Ohio. In fact, I'm at um, Everhard Road. We're on the intersection of Everhard and Whipple Road here in Canton, Ohio, my hometown. I'm here to visit uh, my sister and my kids and just found out the great news that tonight and in just a few hours I'm driving to Cleveland to take out to dinner Sharon and her daughter Francesca. Francesca being the one who launched us on this wonderful study of how we were formed in the womb by God. We were woven together, we were cared for. It's such a bloody miracle that God can't even think of the technical term. He, he can think of it, he just can't, doesn't want to blow our minds with it. So he says that we were woven together as in the nether parts of the earth. And who has ever seen the never the nether parts of the earth? Yeah, only in the movies. Journey to the center of the earth, only in the movies. Nobody's ever seen it. God's making a point. And the point is that his work with us is so deep that he can only give us the fringes of it. But the fringes here in Psalm 139, and thank you, Francesca, for encouraging me to do a series of shows on this topic. I love it. And as you can see, we have gotten great comments because people are just, when they see the sovereignty of God, it brings such comfort. At least it does to people who <laughs> like the idea that such a God, the God we know, who is love, is in such tight control of our lives. We wouldn't have it any other way. And the people who don't want God in control of their lives, well, they've got a little problem, and they're going to need a little adjustment to their attitude. But until then, they go flying high, and they tell us that we're crazy. But actually, they're crazy. Okay, now let's see. Hopefully, um... Sharon and Francesca will allow me to take a photo with them, and I'll share that with you tomorrow. Um, I want to broadcast from my rental car tomorrow. I think that would be fun. The old, you know, a throwback to the old car cam days. Uh, we'll see how that works. So I am in verse 16. Your eyes saw my embryo. And we know that it was far deeper than this because the previous verse, verse 15, the psalmist says, I was woven together as in the nether parts of the earth, and your eyes saw my embryo. We're almost going from a more specific, more controlling statement. That is God, we actually making a human being and then seem to be backing up here and to say that, to say that your eyes saw my embryo. Well, of course they did. Of course, if he formed them, then his eyes saw the embryo. Now, we know that God doesn't literally have eyes. This is a figure of speech known as condescension. The Latin term is anthropomorphia, when God takes the characteristics of a human being that he doesn't literally have, all right? But the thought here is that in verse 15, we're looking at the physical construction of a human being. We're, and we're about to look at, get this, we are about to look at the physical construction of the your the days of your life. Sounds like the great name for a soap opera. Days of our lives. Wow. That's, that's brilliant. Now, so we have the physical aspects in verse 15 woven together. In verse 16, we have the eyes. So in verse 15, may I suggest that we're speaking of God's hands, and which is a physical thing, which is God's technical building of a human being. But when we see your eyes saw my embryo, the eye speaks of knowing. The eye speaks of the all-seeing eye of God, who not only makes things but knows things, and he sees things. And as I told you yesterday, when does, when does God's control, his total control in the womb, when does that evaporate? When does that disintegrate? Where is the line where his total control becomes human free will? We know that line does not exist, okay? Thank goodness. So, it's a, so you, your eyes 
saw my embryo. I mean, you know how when we finally become uh, members of the body of Christ, we come to a realization of truth, and then we look back, right, and, and we see how everything God did in our lives led us to that day, that moment when we said, oh, I get it. And the Spirit of God came on us and we understood who we were, who we are. We came a believer on that day. And we look back and we see, man, God orchestrated my entire life to bring me to this moment. This verse is going back even farther, even farther than that, because it says, your eyes saw my embryo. So apparently there are important things happening in the embryo, and we know there are, such as DNA, every little thing written in the code to make you who you are, and God is supervising it while he's making it. Thus, your eyes saw my embryo. Holy, that goes way back. That goes way back. You were quite a youngin when you were in embryonic form. Now, here it is. That was verse 16. This is also verse 16. And my days, all of them, I like the repetition here, and my days, all of them were written upon your scroll. The days they were formed, using the same word as he uses to speak of making the human being, my days they were formed when there was not one of them. This is rich, and it's quite deep. Let's go to the beginning here. My days, all of them. This is repetition. My days, all of them. This is repetition to get us in our mind that there is not one day of our lives that's accepted from this wonderful truth that they were written upon God's scroll. Now, the Zender version here for scroll would be script. And I've told you many times that God wrote a script ahead of time. He was, he's the scriptwriter of the whole Aeonian times. You see, but that's not in view here. We know from other verses that, of course, the eons came out of God. Christ created the eons, and it was all part of the script. It was all planned ahead of time. But here we get wonderful specifics about God's micro-control. Yes, he's a micromanager. That term is not associated uh, it doesn't have good associations with us. A micromanager is usually a bad boss who just hovers over you, tells you what to do every second. But God is a benevolent micromanager, and you wouldn't want it any other way. And in fact, you couldn't have it any other way, or you would die. So interesting, these people that say they're atheists, God is giving them life and breath and all. He's giving them the breath to tell people that they're atheists. What? idiocy. What oblivion. God has locked those people up in stubbornness. Thank God he has unlocked us, and we see that truth and even deeper truths as we're looking in here too. My days, all of them were written upon your scroll or your script. God doesn't literally have a scroll. Uh, he doesn't roll up a parchment. He doesn't keep a list like Santa Claus to see whether you're naughty or nice. This is again this is very symbolic language here because it's speaking of God. Um, of a definite, I like the written, written. And what I think of when I see the word written, I think of when Jesus said not one jot or tittle will be abolished from the law until all is fulfilled. Um, in other words, every little part, every little mark, whether it's the dotting of an eye or the crossing of a T, that's the Zender version of that, is specific. It has to be that way. Every detail. Now, some would say, well, this is just the days. Like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, right? God wrote the days on his scroll. And in the minds of sicko Christians, sorry for the redundancy, they see this scroll, and well, it must be a big calendar. Like, God just has all these squares, like a 30-day calendar, and they're open, and they're open. So the only thing God writes is just the outer outlines. He makes Monday, he makes Tuesday, he makes Wednesday, but it's up to you to make every day a Friday, according as our 
enemy, Joel Osteen says. But this is not the case at all. We have other verses to corroborate that. And you know I'm going to go to them because that's what I do. Whether I'm in Fort Lauderdale or Canton, Ohio, whether I'm in my cottage or in a... Did I say I was in a Motel 6? No, I'm in a Red Roof Inn. I can't remember. Yeah, this is definitely a Red Roof Inn. Whether I'm in Fort Lauderdale or in a Red Roof Inn on Everhard Road in Canton, Ohio. A corroborating verse, of course, is Isaiah 46.10. God knows the end from the beginning. He knows the end. He doesn't... In fact, that's the King James Version. The concordant version of the Old Testament is even better there in Isaiah 46.10. It's this. God tells the end from the beginning. As I've told you, God doesn't need to go to the end to see what's going to happen as if he has some giant telescope, looks at what's going to happen, and then comes back and then decides what's going to happen because he saw you doing it already, exercising your free will. God's looking down through the telescope of time. Oh, it looks like uh, Francesca's a believer. She decided to believe in me. Therefore, I'll come back to my time and I'm going to have to pre-designate her because I saw her believe in me. Of course, we know that's not true. That's uh, song and dance from Christians who hate the truth that God is in control and they're not. God tells the end. Tells corresponds in verse 16 of Psalm 139 with the word written. Because we picture dictation. We picture God dictating, for instance, the scriptures to the scripture writers, people like King David here. And God tells and they write. God tells, they write. It comes out of his mouth. It's recorded on the page so that we can understand it. All my days were written. All the details, why? Because God told it. He told every detail of your life. Not just Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but every single thing that would fill Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. If you want another corroborating verse, it's Acts 17, verse 28. Uh, in him we live and move and are. In Acts, of course, 17, 25, God gives to all life and breath and all. So all the details of your day, he's giving to you as it happens. According to what was written on a scroll, before these days were formed. That's the shocking information here. The days they were formed, they were formed. This is a word that speaks of a craftsman. They weren't just like thrown together. They were formed, carefully dictated. Do you realize that? Your day, today, yesterday, the day before, every single day of your life was formed already. Formed like a potter making a vase. This can't be just giant blocks of time where you fill in with your free will. Of course not. All the days were formed when there was not one of them. Before one of these days came into being, God had already, God already knew what you were going to do, who you were going to be. The conclusion of David in verse 17 is, how precious are your thoughts of to me, your thoughts to me. I was going to say, it, my mind wanted to say, how precious are your thoughts of me? Because that's the way, what we would say. So this is really different. How precious are your thoughts to me? Okay. It's David's impression. The impression he gets. The, the comfort he gets from knowing God's thoughts. And what we've been reading all week are God's thoughts. I hate to use the word thoughts, even though David uses it here. I'm not going to criticize him, but these are more than thoughts. God is detailing for us his methods, his techniques, using very much active verbs. But of course, I guess it's true, uh, before this stuff comes out in the real world, before it's written, it enters God's mind. It enters God's mind. This is then the order of things. Since I'm looking at the word, word thoughts, I have to deal with it here. It's bringing things to me. The first thing God has is a thought. Then he tells the thought. 
and then the telling is written. That is the threefold way that God transmits information to us. He thinks it, he tells it, tells it, and it is written. And he is doing that in Psalm 139 concerning our beginnings in this world. But as we can see, uh, our birth is not our, it's our beginning as a human being. But God had this in mind all the time. He had it planned. He knew it was coming. I'm not saying we existed before we were conceived. We weren't. We didn't exist. But God certainly knew us. And he had written it in the script that we would exist. Remember, even in, in the movies, a script writer writes a script before the roles are assigned. Right? You have a script and then you say, oh, Tom Hanks would be great in this role. Or Ava Gardner, to go back to another era, would be great in this role. Jack Lemmon, we're going to put him here. So, God has all the casting done. You see, God is even more uh, on the ball than that because he has the casting done at the same time he writes the script. And the amazing thing is that they were formed when there was not one of them. This goes along with Isaiah 46.10. It has nothing to do with God looking ahead of time. This, this, this blows up all the time games that free will people play that want to try to convince you that, well, God just... Leave things, leave things open for you. How could this be interpreted as God leaving things open? Because they were formed when there was not one of them. This obliterates free will. And it was Francesca that said to me, Martin, this verse obliterates human free will. And I said, yeah, why don't we go to this verse more often? So I, then I thought, I mean, I'm going to go to this verse more often and show that if our days are formed ahead of time, and God knows us so intimately, and the Lord directs our steps from the Proverbs, then there's no room for human free will. Now, one more verse I want to bring you from Romans chapter 9 concerning Jacob and Esau. I'm in verse 10 of Romans chapter 9. I'll close with this. Yet not only so, but Rebekah also is having her bed of one Isaac, our father. We know that Isaac was the father of Jacob and Esau. For not as yet being born, speaking of Jacob and Esau, not as yet being born, nor putting into practice anything good or bad. Oh, I had a lady write me this morning. I was eating at Bob Evans' restaurant, which is right, right, conveniently located next to my hotel. And she wrote me, and she, she confessed some terrible thing she was doing. And then she said, I'm afraid that because of this thing, I won't be snatched away. And I had to remind her that God knew her ins and outs. Of course, I exhorted her to do the right thing, to change course. But I also reminded her that this thing was planned ahead of time. Of course, God knows what he's doing. And I quoted to her 2 Timothy 1.9, 1, one of the most comforting verses there is, is that God calls us with a holy calling, not in accord with our acts. This calling is not in accord. That is, there's no agreement between, there's no agreement. Watch the Red Roof Inn cam. There's no agreement between this calling of God and our acts. Our acts are completely irrelevant, whether good or evil. We didn't get ourselves into it, and we can't get ourselves out of it. If it's independent of acts, then there's only two conclusions you can reach. We didn't get ourselves, ourselves into this call. We didn't instigate it. And we can't get ourselves out of it. No good behavior that we could do could get us into it. So that means no bad behavior we do can get us out of it. And I told this woman that. And I reminded her that because of verse 11. Not as being born, nor putting into practice anything good or bad. There it is. That the purpose of God, not your purpose, that the purpose of God may be remaining as a choice. Oh, choice, choice, see? Not out of acts. The choice is not out of acts, that is human acts, but of him who is calling. My goodness. If Romans 9, 10, and 11 doesn't do away with human free will, then Psalm 139 sure as heck does.